Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is Growth Strategies, an ex Merrill advisor on going from practice to firm to $4 billion enterprise. It's a conversation with Brett Bernstein, CEO and co-founder of XML Financial Group. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is the Diamond Podcast for Financial Advisors. This podcast is designed for advisors like you, who are interested in learning more about the evolving wealth management industry through candid dialogue with breakaway advisors, those from the C-suite, and industry thought leaders. It's available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. So be sure to subscribe and share it with your colleagues. At Diamond Consultants, our mission is to help advisors live their best business life. We want every elite advisor to find exactly the right place for their business and their clients to thrive, whether it's at a wirehouse, a regional, boutique, or independent firm. As the industry's leading recruiters and consultants, we've transitioned more than a quarter of a trillion dollars in assets under management in the past decade. And each year, 25% of transitioning advisors who manage a billion dollars or more are our clients. Curious about where, why, and how advisors like you are moving? Download the latest advisor transition report to learn more, including intel on recruiting deals and our insight and analysis on the latest trends in the wealth management space. You'll find it at diamond-consultants.com forward slash transition report. Or if you'd like to talk, feel free to give us a call at 908-879-1002. Why do some advisors feel so strongly about the pull toward independence? In short, some are just entrepreneurial at heart and restrictions on their ability to think and act creatively can ultimately limit their ability to thrive. Brett Bernstein is one such advisor who just a couple years after becoming a licensed broker at Merrill, recognized he was getting bored, as he put it. But taking on the role of producing sales manager kept him happy enough until 2004 when he recognized that the concept of being one of thousands in a firm meant being managed to the lowest common denominator. Brett's sentiment rings true for many advisors to this day. While the wirehouses provide the support, platform, and tech stacks that serve most well, it's not for everyone. Brett and his team moved on to LPL, a firm that at the time looked very different than it does today, where he grew the business to some $550 million in assets. Yet still, he and his team were feeling limited and not able to act like the true fiduciaries they wanted to be. Ultimately, as Brett put it, they outgrew the broker-dealer model they were in. So in 2016, Brett and his team took the next big leap to independence and partnered with Focus Financial. For Brett, the steps represented what he describes as moving from building a practice, then a firm, and now an enterprise, each with a goal of putting the right pieces in place to impact growth. And when it comes to growth, it's pretty clear Brett and his team know what they're doing. Today, XML Financial Group, a name that's derived from X Merrill Lynch, has client assets in the range of $4 billion. In this episode, Brett and I have a candid conversation about what it really takes to grow. He talks about the limitations he felt that kept him from thriving in the wirehouse. He shares why he didn't opt for a transition deal from another big firm and why he sees Focus Financial as their horsepower to help turbocharge growth, and much more. It's a real-world narrative around what it takes to really grow and thrive in the wealth management industry. There's plenty of actionable advice to share, so let's get to it. Brett, I am incredibly grateful for your time today. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Appreciate you having me. Thanks so much. 
pleasure. All right, lots to talk about. Excited to hear from you. So let's jump into it. Let's start at the beginning. Tell us about yourself, your path to becoming the CEO of XML Financial Group. Yeah, so I graduated the University of Maryland School of Business and took the lowest paying job at Merrill Lynch. It was a great training program to start with, but I realized rather quickly that my entrepreneurial spirit was not going to be able to thrive there. And after a couple of years and being a uh, producing sales manager and building a nice clientele, I decided it was time to branch out. And almost 20 years ago, we founded XML. Got it. I'm going to ask you about it in a little while because I love how you came up with the name XML. But before we do that for a little more perspective, tell us a little bit about your partners. Yeah. So currently there's five of us and my co-founding partner, Rob Canner, joined me from Merrill. We've done a few mergers along the way. Curtis Congdon joined us through a merger. Mark Sampson joined us and we promoted our chief compliance officer, Jen Zaro, to be a partner as well. Got it. Okay. So let's tell our audience about the genesis of the name XML because a lot of breakaway advisors, that is advisors leaving the traditional space to form an independent firm, struggle with what to name it. It's hard to come up with a name that hasn't already been taken and that's meaningful. So where did XML come from? Yeah, we intentionally did not want to name our firm after us because it's not about Brett or Rob or any of the partners. So we intentionally did not use our names. There's a legacy that we were building. And at the time we were going through what we wanted to call the name and we were thinking through and it's a Super Bowl time. And if you think about the Super Bowl, the Roman numerals, the power of the Roman numerals, and I joked and said, oh, we should call ourselves X Merrill Lynch. And that's the XML. We do not trade as X Merrill Lynch, but it was jokingly among the partners as where we were coming from of what we would call our firm. And so we took the power of the Roman numerals, which ironically are a section of the tax code about asset acquisition, believe it or not. But it was really to build something that had a powerful look. It had a story behind it. And it was more than just Bernstein, Canner, and so-and-so. And hence, that's how the name came to be. Well, it's the X Merrill Lynch part that gave me a chuckle. So I love it. Tell us a little bit about XML's value proposition. So if you were meeting a prospect, what would you say to them about what the firm does? Yeah, look, at the end of the day, we do what a lot of people do. We provide holistic wealth management, financial planning, and I think we do a really good job at it. I think something that's a little unique is that we bring different facets to the table, right? If I speak for myself, I've been on all three sides of the business. I've been in jail, which is what I call the big bank and brokerage house. I went to LPL Financial, the IBD. I call that my halfway house. And then I took off the ankle bracelet and I became free, right? When I went to become a fiduciary and have an RIA. And so I think a unique value that we bring to clients is that we understand the different facets of what clients interact with. And so to bring that experience to the table, but also with a depth of team and talent. But more importantly, I think it's the service that we provide the clients. I can't control what the market does, but I can provide the value that we provide them. So I think our unique experience and the caring service that we bring is something that stands us apart. And who are your clients? And I don't mean their names, but what mean size? Are they business people? Are they doctors? What do they look like? Yeah, we did the whole SWOT analysis. And you know what we found? Our clients are well-educated, sophisticated, and busy people. They're not all doctors. They're not all lawyers. They're not all government employees. They had a common theme. So instead of having a niche, we focused on those three trends. Our typical client is what I would call mass affluent to high net worth. And I define that as basically half a million to 10 or $12 million. That's our sweet spot. Doesn't mean we don't have larger, doesn't mean we don't have smaller, but that is our sweet spot. And we love that client base. And I think we know the sandbox that we play in and we play in it well. Got it. So let's talk a little bit about numbers and timing just to give our audience some perspective. So I think I read, I know you left Merrill in 2004. I think I read you left with about 110 million in assets. Is that accurate? That sounds about right. Yeah. And then, as you said, you moved from there to LPL. And were there for a period of time. And when you left LPL, you left with about $550 million under management. Is that right? Yeah, you're right on. Today, XML manages about three and a half to $4 billion. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So I'm going to want to talk. I want to get to that extraordinary growth. Uh, you already mentioned some acquisitions you did. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But talk to us a little bit about the comment you made around Merrill 
moving to a halfway house, LPL, an independent broker dealer, and the decision to leave LPL and, as you say, become fully independent of full fiduciary by launching XML? All three of those platforms and all three of the firms are all great. So it depends on what each of the of you are looking for, right, in your business model. For me, I think I started off, it was the entrepreneurial spirit. And Merrill was great, as I said, to kick off my career. LPL was a great place to build that independence. But at the end of the day, we wanted to do something more extraordinary. And with all the success we had with LPL, we had outgrown them, at least at that iteration of what LPL was when we left in 2016. And so we made the decision that we wanted to go out on our own. We wanted to have our own RIA. Subsequently, I now have a broker dealer. That's a whole different discussion. But we wanted to really decide with this fork in the road, did we want to go and continue to be a lifestyle practice? And there's nothing wrong with that. And trust me, there's days that I'm like, God, I wish there were seven of us, not 55 of us. But we decided to bring in a partner and turbocharge our growth. And that's what we ultimately did in 2016 when we left LPL and formed XML in the current state that it's in and brought in Focus Financial Partners as our horsepower behind us. It was to really turbocharge our growth. And we felt, why not have the biggest and best in the industry with the M&A experience and obviously a war chest of capital to allow us to independently run our own practice and business. And as I said, when you're at a firm like Merrill or any of those, you have a practice. When I went to LPL, I had a firm. And now what I have is an enterprise value where I recycle my equity among partners and next gen team members which is something that we wanted to get to. And in our iteration of the business, we needed to have the right partners in order to do that. So I love that. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about why focus, not only why focus as an investor, but why then, why bring them on? What was your thinking around selling equity and all of that? I want to get to that. But I want you to clarify something for me. So LPL is an independent broker dealer. So number one, you left Merrill Lynch in 2004 at a time where it was just not in vogue for people to go independent. So the move to LPL was a huge one. And there are two things that make it unusual. One, going independent in general, and two, with only $110 million under management. So talk to me about that first. And then I want to ask you about when you say you were only halfway there at LPL, I want to know what you mean by that, but we'll yeah. get to it. Yeah, I think people thought we were crazy, right? Because everyone took the big checks, if you will, to go from Merrill to Morgan or name the firm. And I have nothing negative to say about any of them. But all the reasons that we were looking to leave Merrill, I couldn't look a client in the eye and say that any of the other big brokerage firms or wirehouses were really any different. So I had to look them in the eye and say, if I took that approach, I'm no different than an athlete taking a paycheck to change. And while I respect people who do that, it wasn't what we were looking for. I, in good conscience, was not looking for that. And so we took the risk, right? We went to a firm that no one heard of. At the time, it was Linsco Private Ledger. It hadn't changed its name. They only had about 4,000 advisors, not the almost 20,000 they have today. But we knew that we needed to have the structure that they brought with the IBD, leaving a firm, a big wirehouse like we did. But people thought we were crazy. We didn't get a check up front. We had to come out of pocket to start our business on our own and obviously leaving a firm like Merrill, you don't announce it, right? You leave on a Friday afternoon and and be very careful of following all the rules and guidelines. And we did. And it was scary. It was definitely scary. And many of our friends thought we were morons for doing it. I have no regrets. It was the best decision that that we ever made. But it's nerve wracking because it was like you said, Mindy, people didn't do that. So I don't want to say that we were pioneers. Maybe people thought we were stupid, but certainly... To be entrepreneurial and do the things that we wanted to do, we knew that we had to take that risk. Okay. So LPL is an independent broker dealer. And by the way, in fairness to LPL, they have iterated about a thousand times since you were there. They do pay significant transition money today, and they offer a whole lot of support that and resources that accelerate growth that they probably didn't offer then. But at the time, what was it when you were at LPL? It said, I'm already independent, but what was missing? What couldn't you do there that you're able to do now? A couple of things. So I never went on any of the trips and stuff, but I did at the time. And I, I went on one trip and I met with Dan and I met with Mark, who was there at the time, or Cassidy and others. And at the time we'd been there 12 years and I gave them the 12 things that I have seen over the 12 years you were there. 
it started to feel a little bit like Merrill because remember, our licenses are hung with them. I was using their RIA and their broker dealer, which means they have company initiatives that we have to follow. I'm not saying they're wrong, but in ways of doing things, I started to feel that because we're now being lumped in with 15 or 20,000 advisors, it was feeling a little less independent. And when I sat with Mark and Dan, they point blank said, Brett, you have a great business. You've outgrown us. And we don't follow you if you wanted to leave. And I'd looked at their hybrid model. I'd even pitched them about acquiring XML as the first firm and let me help build their entire succession model with all the independents. But at the time, right, that wasn't what they were looking to do. And many, as you said, they've had so many iterations. And so I have nothing negative to say. It was just the iteration of what we were trying to do with our firm to go for, right from a practice to a firm to an enterprise value. At that time, LPL was just not becoming the right home. So I felt a little hamstrung because of being under their company policies on top of what we have to follow with the regulators. So it just made sense for us that it was time to go ahead and step away. But again, all on great terms there. Um, it was an amazing firm. I have nothing negative to say. Yeah. I think you got there, there meaning full fiduciary RAA when you were meant to. And maybe you wouldn't have gotten where you are today without being at LPL. So you're not disparaging LPL. You're just saying that it was the right place for you at the right time, but you outgrew it. Okay. So I want to backtrack a little. Because you made a move that was so not mainstream at the time, what was your why for making the leap to independent? What was going on at Merrill at the time you left? And you said staying at Merrill or going to Morgan Stanley or UBS just wasn't what we were looking for. So what was what you were looking for? At the end of the day, it was a different era. We had just come out of the dot-com bubble. Most firms were having trouble with conflicts of interest. If you think back in the day with Elliot Spitz, they're not as personal issues, but what was going on, the conflicts of interest between the investment banking and the research arms, you have stock lists being recommended that weren't performing the way you want. And you just felt like, God, I'm being pushed into this. And, and for me, being a producing sales manager, I was giving a presentation to the complex that I was helping. And, and the topic was, are you getting your 60 cents worth? Meaning- Barrel was taking 60 cents and we're getting about 40. And I'm like, I'm not. I'm apologizing for so many things. And it wasn't any different at any of the large firms, right? So again, this is not to disparage Merrill because it was a great firm, but with all the things that were going on coming out of that tech bubble.com issue, we just looked at it and said, I didn't see that the grass was greener in the same environment. And at the end of the day, Speaking for myself, not my partners, the entrepreneurial drive that I've had since I was a child could not fully come to fruition when you have to work under a large company's guidelines. And I respect that, which is why Merrill or any of the firm like Merrill were not the right fit at that time. And LPL was for many years until you pointed out before, until it wasn't. Okay, fair enough. And again, if you've listened to any of the podcast guests I've been privileged to have on, any breakaways like you, everyone says the same thing. Insert Merrill, insert Morgan, insert UBS, insert Wells, whatever it is, big firms are bureaucratic. And when people choose to go independent, it's not because the firm is bad. It's just because they outgrow them and they want to do something different. So you mentioned, I love how you said it. We had a goal of first building a practice, which is what we felt we did at Merrill, of building a firm, which is what we felt we did when we were at LPL, and now building an enterprise. What is the difference between those three things as you see it? Yeah. So I think, and all are great in their own respect. I think when you build a practice, usually it's a person or a lot of the firms have pushed teams. And there's, at the end of the day, the large firm owns your business, right? Yes, you have the client relationships, but they own it. So there's no real ability to sell your business. And yes, there are retirement programs that the firms have put into place. And I think they're very smart to have done that, but you're not getting the full value of what you've built. They just make it easy. When you have a firm, usually it's the same thing. A lot of times with the firms, what happens is you get to have, I think like Mortimer and the group, right? These older advisors don't want to ever give up. And so when you bring these younger advisors in, at some point, they start to get resentful because the older generation continues to milk the money out of the business. The younger team feels that they're the one doing all the work. No one wants to sell the equity. And a lot of times the businesses implode or people just leave, or they don't get a fair value for it. It's not to say that there aren't many successful ones. On the enterprise approach that we focus on, I think that is what focus has, has really helped all of us, is that 
the value of our business, the enterprise value is the recycling of the equity. And so anyone that I talk to, that I hire, I interview, I immediately tell you equity is something that may be considered for the right person at the right time. As I mentioned, my chief compliance officer is an equity owner. She's not a producer. She is a chief compliance officer. So I truly believe that at the right people at the right time, you have those discussions. And not a lot of firms will have that out of the gate because they're quite, oh, I want equity. Oh, no, I'm not right because equity is the most coveted thing. And it is. We had a partner that we parted ways on good terms many years ago and remain friends. And when my partner Rob and I did that, we said, we got divorced. We will never give up equity again, right? Because he just had got out of a relationship. And now I have five partners and we're talking to other people that if we do transactions with them, they're going to become partners too. I changed my mindset of looking at how, what our business was, right? It goes back to the practice, the firm and the enterprise. And I'd rather have a slightly smaller percentage of a much bigger and growing practice or business, which ultimately is worth more money. It's just a different mindset. It doesn't mean the other ones are wrong. It just means what's right for what you're trying to do. And what's right for you. That's the point behind it all. I think the greatest and most exciting thing about how the industry has evolved, and certainly the industry landscape has evolved, is that the choices used to be really limiting. If there was an entrepreneurial-minded advisor two decades ago, still his choice was either stay put or go to Morgan or UBS and hope that by some small degree, it would be a little more entrepreneurial, a little less bureaucratic. And while you can make some cases, it might be someone like you, who's got uber entrepreneurial DNA, it never would have been enough. So that makes really good sense. Let me ask you a question. Relative to the transition at the time you left Merrill, The number one thing that people are most terrified about is, will the firm come after me? Now, Merrill today is part of protocol, and that's a good thing. So an advisor leaving Merrill, as long as he or she goes to another protocol firm, it's a protocol move, and that makes the move less scary or less risky. But I read that Merrill, in fact, came after you. So what can you tell us about that? What's the call there? Look, different time. This is 20 years ago almost. Most firms try to come after you to scare you and intimidate you. What we did was follow the rules and follow the law. And if you do that, there's nothing to be scared about. And Merrill did not win. And that is the moral of the story. We didn't break any securities rules. We didn't solicit. We didn't break our contracts, right? They try to scare you. They try to scare you because of the name that we use. As I said, we don't trade as ex-Merrill Lynch, but they try. They try to get a temporary restraining order. They basically got almost nothing because we didn't break the rules. And a lot of times what the big firms do is they take the same document they use for the firm, the people who left last Friday, and they use the same document for this Friday, but it's different. And that's what they did with us. And it blew up in their face. But more importantly, we just followed the rules. If you have good counsel and you have good relationships and you follow the rules, protocol or not, you'll be fine. I think the message is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're right to be scared. In other words, don't be a cowboy. Don't think there's zero risk in making a move. But if you make the move the right way, you have good counsel who understands the business and understands the rules of the road, especially when leaving a protocol firm. But even if not, as long as you follow the rules and do what you're told, you'll be fine. Yeah, I agree. So let me ask you a question. Again, back when you were leaving Merrill, especially because you said LPL wasn't offering any transition money at the time, was it hard to forgo the notion of a big recruiting deal at the time? Yeah, certainly for us, it was seven figure deals, right? So we were all fairly young. I had my first child, right? You're sitting there going, ooh, it's a lot of money. But we were looking for something bigger. And remember, the recruiting deals a lot of times come in a forgivable note. So if you bring enough business and the markets do well, then it's great. But if your business goes down and you have to tap into that recruiting dollars, then it really wasn't necessarily worth it. So when we were looking at that mindset, because we had seen people leave and the dot-com hit and they were having to eat into their money to survive, we looked at it and said, that's not going to make or break us, right? Putting a million or two million or whatever the number was at that time, while it was a lot of money and it still is today, we were shooting for something bigger. And so I'm not going to be um, penny wise, pound foolish, or in that case, a couple million wise, pound foolish when we had a bigger goal that we were striving for. But yes, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't in the back of our minds. 
Although the truth of the matter is with 110 million under management, the size of the deal you would have gotten would have paled in comparison to the value of the enterprise, to use your words, you've built with today three and a half billion and growing under management. Oh yeah. Even investing that money and doing really well, not even in the same ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's pivot and talk a little bit about the decision to partner with Focus. So again, we're talking about leaving Merrill, going to LPL as an independent broker dealer, spending about six years there as an independent, and then making the decision to break away and become a fiduciary or an RIA. And at that point, I imagine the decision was, do we go it alone? Or do we bring in a partner like Focus Financial? And the reason I limit it to those two options, because the probably the most popular category today for breakaway advisors didn't exist then. That category is not selling to an investor, but rather bringing using a service provider or a platform firm that can help to facilitate the move. Those options didn't exist in those days. But between sort of the two categories, going it alone in partnership, building with a Pershing Fidelity Schwab, a custodian, or selling a portion of equity to focus financial in perpetuity, how did you come to that decision to, in fact, partner with focus? There was an article written on us in Registered Rep years ago. We had met with focus their first year in business. And we went to New York. They only had a couple of firms. We listened to the Dog and Pony show. I'm like, ah, it's amazing. But it didn't make sense, right? We were too small, but thank them for that. Fast forward, right? We were getting to the point with LPL where we felt we had outgrown them. And I got a phone call. I never take those calls, but I took it. And it was Focus. And they walked me through what they had done. And I went, holy crap, everything you told me, your first year of business, not only did you do, you did it bigger and faster. And I said to my partner, we need to listen to them. And we did. And we were blown away. We had known the other players in the industry. But as far as I'm concerned, and I'm not saying this because Focus is a partner, no one pales in comparison to them. And I knew what other offers were there. And it wasn't about the money. I was not looking to take any chips off the table. I was not looking to sell some of my cash into perpetuity. But that's just how the deals work. And that's where Rob and I had the fork in the road. And it really was, do we go at it alone? We had done a small little acquisition. It was killing us in phantom income because the the bank loans and it was paying for itself, but I wasn't really reaping any of the benefits of all my hard work. And I said, this isn't going to work. I'll do a deal here, deal there, but that's not what we were looking for. So we said they did everything they said they were going to do. And we really felt like it was a partnership. And I still feel that today, even though they've gone public, they've gone private, they've sold a lot of iterations. But I still feel that they treat it like a partnership, not like I'm answering to someone. And so, again, what they told me in 2007 was exactly what I believed in 2016 when we made the deal, if you will, and what I still believe today in the beginning of 24 with obviously the founders not being there and CDR owning it. Okay. So not everyone listening may know what focus is. From the definition of what focus's value proposition is essentially the largest investor in the independent space. But you're talking about them as being a partner, not just a capital partner, but a strategic partner that has enabled you to fuel growth and operational efficiency and all of that. So talk to us, give us a 60 second pitch on what focus is, what their value proposition is, and how what they do relates to your goals, what your goals are were at the time, I should say, for the business. Yeah, focus has changed a little bit, right, with our new leadership there. But in essence, they are a non-controlling, silent partner at the end of the day. We each individually run and operate our own businesses. That is the bottom line, and that is the most important. We are not merged under one ADV. We collectively are a partnership to help each other. But I run my own P&L. I run my own business. But what I have is roughly 90 partner firms. And they're holding company staff that has done hundreds of M&A recruiting and hiring. And so when I have a question, I go to my team and they say, you should talk to this firm or that firm because they've already done a new operating agreement or they've got a great marketing strategy. They've seen it all. So I had the benefit of that. And what was different, for example, when I was at Merrill versus now, if I had a question for a Merrill advisor, no one wanted to give their trade secret or they wanted a cut. And here... I can have 
some of the largest RAs in the industry hand me their operating agreement and say, here, just use this. It was crazy to me to see. Because we're the partner. Because you, because you're a partner, and Focus helps you figure that out. But they're not going to tell me what to do. I do what I want to do. But why would I go there and not rely on someone of that size with that experience to help put me in touch with different people that have already been there? Take Michael Nathanson in the Colony Group. Everyone knows him, right? He's he's, he's a legend, if you will, in our industry. He's been a great friend and mentor. The things that he's done in growing that business all along the way and where he is has been great in giving me advice. Adam Bierenbaum at Buckingham, same thing. To take advice from mentors like that who have been where we are, right? And they're like, this is the way you should be thinking and make changes while you are small enough and able to pivot because when you get to some of their sizes, it becomes a little harder. It's amazing advice. That's what I wanted, my partner and Rob and I wanted, and my existing partners now today wanted in this collaborative environment that we have with Focus. Doesn't mean you have to do that. There are many partners like, leave me alone. I'm just doing my business. And that's fine too. Right. Okay. But selling to Focus means selling a portion of equity. And the number one concern for any business owner is A, losing control, and B, and a close second B, is selling equity. Am I selling my upside, essentially, and am I selling it too soon? How did you reconcile that? There's a couple ways of looking at it. I'm a direct partner. Um, It's different now. You've been reading stuff with hubs and different things. The business model is evolving. But for us specifically, at the end of the day, we are a wholly owned subsidiary. So we did sell our business, but there are different pieces of the business. There's the operating company that Focus has a piece of cash flow on. That is just how it works. And then there's a management company that the partners reside in that has an equity value and we run the business. What is important is that when people are looking at joining a firm, let's just say joining Focus firms, is that some are looking to take chips off the table, become an employee, make their lives easier. Other people, I'll use Mark Sampson, my partner from Fort Washington, Pennsylvania. It made sense for Mark to be a partner. When we started our conversation, he was just looking for a long-term succession plan. And he got excited and invigorated by what we were doing and said, I want to be part of that leadership team. And so he decided to take some of his consideration in his transaction and merge it into our management company and became a partner. So it depends. Each conversation that I have, and I can only speak for the conversations I have, it depends where people are and what they're looking for. So yes, did Mark sell his business? Yes, he did. But Mark took what I call a different bites of the apple. He got some consideration for the transaction. He's obviously helping run and grow a business, and he owns a piece of equity that at some point he will monetize and have another bite of the apple. That made sense for Mark. Another merger we did, it didn't. The person was looking to sunset out in a shorter time period. So each conversation that we have, at least at XML, we have to look at what that individual or what that firm or practice is looking to accomplish and then find the right solution. So yes, are you giving up some control? Of course. Are you giving up some equity? Of course. But if you were to ask Mark, he has full say, full control, does everything the same. It's a little different, of course. And I presume Mark and Curtis, who you said is the other one who you you did an acquisition with, believed that by joining you, that what they gave up paled in comparison to what they could gain. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. Because each of them, who I assume were independent before they joined you, could have gone out and built their own XML, their own firms, or stayed fully independent, but instead they opted to join you. Yeah, I mean, Curtis um, came from an existing focus firm, one of the original ones, and they were looking for a succession plan. And this is a perfect example, Mindy, of control. Focus could not force anything. They said, you two firms should talk. Now, they happen to have a broker dealer. I came from that world. And at the end of the day, we were able to retire the senior partner. Curtis became an equity partner, and I'm now the proud owner of a broker dealer. Not many focus partners would do that because they don't care or have that experience. It right. made sense. Mark already had. Mark was at Finet, so Mark was like an LPL, if you will, advisor. Right. He already had his own firm, but he was looking at Mark still very young, but he was looking at the next decade plus and saying, I need to set up a succession for my team and for my clients 
But what he found along the way was, wow, I can be part of something more and bigger. And how I was introduced to Mark was from Bob Collins when we acquired the Collins Investment Group, another finance firm in Bethesda, Maryland. But if you had told me inside of 10 months in the middle of a pandemic that I would have acquired over $1.7 billion of client assets, I would have said, no, there's no way. Right. But the focus relationship, the growth that we've had, the people that we have brought together, and look, the horsepower of money they had helped bring this together. But if you told me when March of 20 kicks in that I would have done those two transactions, I would have laughed in your face. Right. Okay. So a lot to unpack there, but one of the key questions is, I think what I hear you saying is that without the focus horsepower, the operational knowledge, the capital, the know-how, the bandwidth, you wouldn't have made those acquisitions. You wouldn't have acquired that 1.7 billion in assets. Is that fair to say? I think it would have been harder. And remember, I'm having to go out as little old me trying to convince and sell you on why you should pick me when there's Mercers and other great players right. out there. Um, it enabled you to compete. It enabled me to compete. Correct. Well, yeah. Right. So selling to focus when you did made sense because it sounds like you were clear that a very important goal was to grow inorganically to do acquisitions and likely, as you say, would have been much harder to do without them. So what if you didn't have those goals? Or what if you were thinking about going independent, but you weren't sure that growing inorganically was something you'd want to do? Would you still have sold to focus? I may not have. But remember, I came in as a direct partner. Bob Collins, the Collins Investment Group, and Mark Sampson of Sampson Wealth Management, they joined us. So when people are looking, if you're not a direct partner, joining another firm can still be amazing. Mark and Bob almost never interact or deal with focus at all. That's my role right within the firm. So they get to do what they want. They get to be advisors. They get to work with their clients, work with their teams. So you have to get really deep with what the person or the firm is looking for because firm like us can really help you. When you can plug into our marketing stack, technology stack, operational efficiencies, M&A experience, it's like, wait, I can just hit the ground running but I don't want to deal with any of the stuff you deal with that don't. Right. Well, so you hit it on the head that goes both ways. So that answers the question of why it made sense for you to sell to focus, but it also answers the question about why it was right for, say, Mark Sampson, who could have continued along as an independent advisor with Finet, and why he chose to sell to you as opposed to remaining independent, because he was looking not only perhaps to take some chips off the table, but probably more importantly, to offload a lot of the stuff that it takes to run a business. And he felt that by partnering with you would help him to grow faster. Mindy, that's probably one of the number one things I hear. Advisors are tired. They're tired, if, especially if they're somewhat independent already. They're tired of the compliance. They're tired of, especially if they're at an IBD model, they're tired of always being told no. They actually just want to get back to being advisors. And so finding firms that can allow them to do that and take all offload all those other issues, if you will, is the common theme that I'm hearing from people. They are entrepreneurial. They want to grow. They're just tired of doing all the other crap. Yeah, makes sense. I want to ask you about focus. There's been a lot written in the press about the private equity owners wanting to consolidate the firms. So essentially taking the panoply of focus firms and consolidating them to however many fewer hubs. What will that mean for XML? And what do you think it'll mean for other potential focus prospects? Focus's value proposition was we'll never turn an entrepreneur into an employee, but the notion of consolidation could mean just that. So would love to hear your perspective on it. Yeah, I want to be clear. This is my opinion. I'm not representing focus in this. I think that what Rudy, Regina, and Lenny built was truly amazing. And obviously, CDNR has come in, and both founders have since retired and moved on. And it's a different business model. What's most important is that Dan Glazier, who is the current CEO and chairman, has never said anything that he has any intention of not making us entrepreneurs. What they're doing is providing different platforms for us to decide what we want to do. If you think that joining a hub makes sense because you want to offload some of the things that you don't want to be doing, or if you are looking for a succession and you don't have that within your existing business, 
then that's an opportunity. And XML, if you want to stay as you are, then go ahead and stay as you are. They cannot force us to, nor are they going to. They're just going to provide us different options that may make sense. And so as you keep seeing news come out about hubs and maybe firms going into the hubs, that's by choice. Interesting. Okay. That's, I actually really appreciate that clarification because I think a lot of the talk around the industry is that what made focus great, the notion that you really didn't cede control. They may own you, but you still own the management company and don't need to ask their permission to do certain things that what made them great was going to change. So I appreciate that. I want to ask you another question. In the past two decades, since you've owned XML or have been the CEO of XML, you the waterfall of possibilities of ways to break away from either an independent broker dealer or a traditional firm like Merrill and leverage the support and ease of moving from one to the other has really expanded. And this whole new category of service providers or platform firms like Sanctuary Financial or even LPL itself has a strategic wealth services unit that is all about what we call supported independence. But none of those require you to sell equity. If that model had existed 20 years ago or 15 years ago or so when you associated with Focus, would you have still opted to sell equity? I'd probably have to learn more. I think the biggest piece was that Focus had the proof of concept and the track record. And so when you look at the firms and what they have done and how they helped them grow, they had already been through the the Great Recession, right? So we had seen what that looked like. To me, if there were other opportunities or platforms out there, maybe it would have made sense. But I, what I had to look at was not Rudy, Lenny, or Regini selling us on, hey, we have this idea. It's you met with us after a year. Look at what we've done. I did due diligence with three partner firms and really dug in. And I'm like, holy crap, if I can do any piece of that, I'm in the Hall of Fame, right? If I was an athlete. And that's what was most important to me. Many great ideas, many great platforms, but it doesn't mean that they had the proof of concept for what we were looking for. Because you really believe that for whatever it has cost you to sell equity to focus, you have more than made up for that in in value add and the ability to do those acquisitions. Well, not just value add of what I think earnings and, and equity, but it's the fulfillment. There's more than just the money. It's the fulfillment that I have a team of almost 55 people. It's the mantra I live by that I want every person that comes to XML to retire to XML. And if I'm doing my job as a leader, you should be growing personally, professionally, and financially. I get fulfillment. My partners get fulfillment by doing that. And I can't put a price on that. That is also what's important to us, not just the almighty dollar, albeit important. That is something that I can't put a price on. And when I look, whenever I retire from this industry, two young daughters, I don't know if I'll ever be able to afford to retire. But I think that I would like to look back and say, I left some mark on people in my organization, on our clients and within the industry. And that's worth more than an extra whatever in dollars. Let's talk a little bit more about XML, and I appreciate all that perspective. You said earlier that your goal in building XML was to build something more extraordinary than you were able to do in the broker-dealer world. And part of that is, I assume, the everything you talked about in terms of the XML value proposition, the acquisitions you've done, et cetera. How did you know that you were ready to get into the M&A game as an acquirer? Yeah. So I think it's, I stumbled on it. My partner and I had parted ways with a partner at the time, and we were very fortunate that we remained friends. It's rare that you change a partnership and actually can still talk to the person. And we said, wow, maybe there's something here. And we decided we had had connected with a a local recruiter who filled tail, right? Every, every 30 minutes with people, you know how that game can work, right? And we stumbled on someone, a solo practitioner who was looking to find succession. And we did a deal on our own. It was a, I don't know, maybe a 80, $90 million firm. And it was great. It was a great uh, transition. The lead advisor is still with us. She's amazing. And we said, huh, like this is exciting. We want to do this. And we learned a lot. But what we realized was we couldn't do it on our own, not to the scale that we wanted to. 
And so we knew we wanted to do something. We tripped on it. We made money doing it, but realized very quickly that there was had to be a better way. And that's when we knew we wanted to go down this path. And if we were going to do it, then we wanted to have the biggest and best behind us. Yeah. And to really professionalize the process. So what are some of the lessons learned? A lot of our listeners are either still working for the big firms and thinking about breaking away or RIAs that are, or independent firms that are either at various stages of their growth. What lessons would you share with them about an M&A strategy? It's very complicated. One of my mentors said, don't expect to make money on your first one. You'll learn on that one and you'll make more and more in each one. And I'll tell you, he was right. I think the biggest thing I've learned is underestimating the human capital. A lot of times people get underpaid, especially in in a smaller practice. And so as you go through that process, it's amazing how people come out of the woodworks. It's like when you do a construction project and you put a 20% contingency. I've learned for each deal, put in the contingency because people a lot of times are underpaid. And no matter how much due diligence you do, you still find stuff. And a lot of times people are understaffed because sometimes they want to juice their earnings up. And so the biggest thing that we've learned, and I give a lot of credit to Focus and their expertise on this, and why we do such an in-depth due diligence process, is sometimes you need to hire people in order to do a deal. And that needs to be factored in. You can't fire three people and say, oh, look at my earnings, and then I pay for that, and then I have to turn around and then hire people. So I think understanding the human capital element, but it's also the synergies. There's a lot of bankers and people out there that try to upsell you on synergies to get a higher valuation, a multiple for their client, which I totally respect, but a lot of times it's BS. So while the seller thinks they're going to get this crazy multiple on these crazy earnings, a lot of times they don't, or if they take the deal, they end up not hitting earnouts and it implodes. So I'd rather be honest, right? This is the real P&L, right? That we're looking at. These are the real earnings. These are the real raises or bodies that we have to hire. And if you buy into that, then you should hit all the growth metrics and things you want to do. But a lot of times people get so caught up on the highest number, not realizing what it's going to do if they don't hit the mark. That is the biggest lesson that I've learned along the way. Thank you. I think our listeners will really appreciate that as well. So talk to us then about XML's goals for growth going forward, both inorganic and organic growth. Look, we all know organic is the cheapest but hardest part to do, right? And I think the bigger firms get, the harder it is to bring in net new assets. It's harder to bring in net new assets because every practice, every business has an aging clientele. You have natural attrition and RMDs and cash going out the door, right? So the bigger you get, as important as organic growth is and it needs to maintain, you have to have good margin control of your P&L. You have to be looking at inorganic growth, in my opinion. And a lot of firms, the market growth is a big piece of it. So that's something that we we all have to focus on. Our goal is to continually grow with inorganic growth. And I say that is what helps you keep the lights on with the cost of business just going up, raises and inflation and rent increase. That to me is what the organic growth for XML does. The human organic growth is what takes us to the next level. And our goal, we don't have a set number. Our goal, it's all about the people. We want good people, whether that's hiring a front desk person to a junior advisor to an M&A acquisition. We want good people. And whether that's someone in New York or in Florida or in the middle of the country does not matter to us. Similar core values and beliefs, good people. They care about the clients. That's what's most important to us. I've walked away from more deals than I've done, not because the deal wasn't right, because the people just weren't the right fit. And what is your pitch to a potential firm? So I'm going to make this up. I'm the principal of a $300 million RIA. I'm doing well. I'm 55 years old. So I just made myself more than six years younger than I really am. But I'm essentially a one-man band. I have support staff, but I don't have partners. And I've reached capacity at a lot of levels. What would XML's pitch be to me? Well, my partner, Rob, says God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. So listen more than you speak. And my first question would be no different than what I do with a client. With a client, I would say, what are the three greatest financial concerns that keep you up at night? 
they're going to tell you exactly what their concerns are so you can solve that problem and they become a client. I would turn it back to you, Mindy, and say, what is the reason that you're willing to take my phone call, this meeting or this Zoom at 55 years of age? What is it you're looking for? You're going to tell me, I want to take chips off the table. I'm burned out, whatever the thing is. And then from that point, I'm going to share with you what we could do to help you solve that problem. I'm not going to walk in and just pitch you, right? It's like me pitching you on stocks. You're like, Brett, I don't do stocks. I do mutual funds. I should have listened to you and asked. So our pitch starts with listening first and then show them examples that we've done and how we can help them try to solve for that. And that's what we did with Bob. That's what we did with Laura May, which is where Curtis came from. That's what we did with Mark Sampson and others that we're talking to now. Listen first and then help them solve. Can you give us some idea of how any one of those acquisitions have worked out? They've, they've obviously worked for you. How did they work for them? How has any one of them grown since selling to you? In Bob Collins' case, Bob has retired. He officially retired at the end of the year. I couldn't be happier for Bob, for his family and he to be able to do that. Bob joined us. He was looking for a transition for his team. Amazing team. They're with us today and they're fabulous. And over the past several years, we were able to integrate some of the efficiencies and processes that we have. Was it different for them? Of course it was. But they have a voice in it. And obviously, with change, there's always going to be some bumps along the way. Every member of his team has taken a more active role. I think the clients have felt just as home the same way. They're dealing with the same people. Along the way, we've added a portfolio manager to the team. We added a new client service associate. We have added a trader. And we added two advisors to the Collins team. And I think because of that and the collective nature of how they work, with the XML team, it allowed Bob to get to a point where he said, I can feel comfortable stepping back now, spending time with my grandchildren, my family, and play golf and do the things that he wanted to do that I think if we hadn't been able to do that, it may not have gotten there. And again, there's always bumps along the road. I'm not going to say everything's rosy, but I think that allowed that team to flourish. And most importantly, the clients to flourish. Yeah. I have to make comment about that. I'm smiling because one of the things we talk with advisors about who are rightly so have a good thing going where they are and yet curious about either whether the grass is greener or there's something better or more they could be doing or a better way to serve clients elsewhere, whether it be independent or otherwise. And one of the questions we ask them is, would you feel good if you left your legacy with fill in the blank firm, Merrill Lynch, UBS, whatever it is? What you're talking about is Bob's legacy, is Bob was able to retire because he was able to know with confidence that the lifetime he put into building his business, the clients, his staff, the business itself was going to flourish without him because he found a good steward for it. Agreed. I would say the hardest thing, so for someone looking to join another firm to sell all or a piece, the hardest part is themselves. That is the most difficult part because you've been the chief cook and bottle wash. You're the rainmaker. You're the everybody. Your name's on the door. And when someone else is there now taking the little bit of the control and making the decisions, it is very hard. And for a lot of advisors, their firstborn was their business. A lot of times they were in this business before they had children or pets or whatever it may be. So the psychological component is very hard. And I want to underscore that and not minimize it because it is very hard because people are looking at whether it's mortality or giving up the business or losing the control. And that is the, the God's honest truth of losing the control, but you've got to do it in the professional, respectful way. But usually the one that, that has the most trouble is always going to be the senior person that is looking to phase back. Yeah. So what does XML look like 10 years from now? And I guess you mentioned it yourself, your exit strategy, your succession, you have young daughters. So I don't know how many years from now you'll be thinking about it, but every firm owner thinks about it or at least should be. So what does it look like? I think I'm dying in my chair because I love what I do. This goes back maybe to the entrepreneurial spirit. I love working with clients and I will always continue to work with clients. No disrespect to CEOs of wealth management firms that aren't advisors, 
But I think something I bring to the table is any person in my firm that I talk to that says, Brett, you don't understand. You're the CEO. No, I still manage a couple hundred million dollars of client assets. So I will always have my hand in the client and I would always love to have the hand in the strategy of the firm. Of course, there'll be other people that should take roles naturally over time. And and naturally, I should phase into different roles, as should my partners. But 10 years from now, I'm only going to be 58. I'm only 48 right now. So I have a long runway. And I think what XML, I believe, will be is exactly what we are today, just bigger. But it needs to have the same feel. Open door policy. I'm casual. Today's a work from home day for me. I drop F-bombs every now and then. I'm a normal human being. We're all like that. And I want that to be the same, whether we're three and a half or four billion in client assets or 35 billion in client assets. I want the same culture and value. And I will never, as long as I'm in charge, never let that change. Again, things have to change as you evolve and grow, of course, the standardized and professionalized things. But to me, that's what I want XML to continue to grow for. And so when I'm not around, when Rob's not around, Curtis, whomever, that same culture, value, and vision will continue on past us. And how will you have monetized your life's work at the end of the day? How have I? <laughs> how will you? How will I? Look, at the end of the day, obviously, there's the, the component of my equity, right, that I sell. But it's also, we're fortunate to be able to give back to the community, as many of us are. And so being able to monetize that whether it's being part of co-founding board member of a local grassroots charity to sitting on the board of an independent school where we sponsor the Shark Tank program where the winning team gets a $10,000 prize to continue their business every year. That's part of our legacy too, to be able to do things like that for the next generation or less fortunate people. That's another way of monetizing it. It's not just my equity's worth this and I got why. It's being able to do these other things along the way. One closing question for you. I think so many advisors that practice as employees struggle with the notion of stay versus go. And even if they believe that there could be an option better elsewhere, they say it's good enough here. It's fine here. It's good enough. And I've had this conversation with a lot of the guests I've been privileged to interview, the notion of good enough. What would you say to, if, if you were lucky enough to sit in front of one of these advisors and they'd say, what would you say to me about that? It's really good enough here. I have a good life. I'm able to coach my daughter's soccer game and I'm home every night for dinner and it's not perfect. It's more bureaucratic than it once was, but it's good enough. I make a really good living. What would you say to that? Then you should do it. I had a friend of the brokerage firm, Big Wire House. He called me. He said, this is how much I do in revenue. I work four days a week. I'm in the top 300 in the firm. I love their services. They treat me great. He said, how much more could you give me in a deal? I said, over a decade, shooting from the hip, $10 million more. He said, it's not worth it. I said, you should stay. You've got a great life, a great business. They treat you well. You use what they use. If you're telling me an extra $10 million over a decade, and that's a lot of money, isn't going to change your lifestyle, you should stay. And you know what he said to me? You're the first person who said that. Because everyone's always like, come. Why? I love what you just said. Because it allows me to say to you, if the only thing that gentleman you're talking about would have been looking to solve for was money and an extra $10 million over a decade wouldn't be enough, then of course he should stay put. I would tell him the exact same thing. The follow-up question to that for somebody like that is, are there other things you're looking to solve for? And if you don't solve for them, meaning you stay put and they're not solved for, will you feel satisfied? If the answer is yes, then it really is good enough. Moving is a giant hassle and you wouldn't and should never do it unless it had the potential to be needle moving enough. It sounds like for that gentleman you're talking about, it really was more than good enough. He wasn't overly dissatisfied and $10 million over 10 years wouldn't have done it for him. Correct. You're spot on. You said it just right. There's so many pieces to the puzzle. At the end of the day, life is a chess match and we have to decide how we want to play that match. And there's quality of life. It's not just money. There's many different things. You're right. Moving a business, it can be monumental. And that's why I go back to the, when you asked me the question a few minutes ago, I asked them, what is it you're trying to solve for? And sometimes the answer is quality of life or product and service or I just want to make the most amount of money. Okay, let's understand that and then let's solve for it. Yeah. And then the potential seller gets to decide if your answer is meaningful enough. 
relative to the hassle factor or weighing against the ease of staying put. We have taken up enough of your time. I am so incredibly grateful that you spent this hour with me, truly. It sounds like you've built something extraordinary. It sounds like you've got a lot of exciting stuff ahead of you. You've built a firm for the right reasons. And I hope that you will come back again a decade from now and you'll be a firm double where you are now. Oh, thank you for having me. We hope you're still here doing this a decade from now and not retire. Me too. <laughs> thank you, Brett. Curious about where, why, and how advisors like you are moving? Download the latest advisor transition report to learn more, including intel on recruiting deals and our insight and analysis on the latest trends in the wealth management space. You'll find it at diamond-consultants.com forward slash transition report. Or if you'd like to talk, feel free to give us a call at 908 879 one zero zero two.